Hey everybody, welcome back to Tend to Life with me, Annie Elise, where we are talking about everything true crime and where I just sit here on my comfy chair. I guess it's kind of hard to see, it's pretty dark in here, but where I just sit down and share a true crime story with you, a true crime case that bugs me for some reason or another, maybe one that you guys have been requesting, one that's kind of weighing heavily on my mind, and we just talk about it like friends. So if you are brand new and you're checking out the channel for the first time, first and foremost, welcome. I hope you appreciate today's case coverage and you feel welcome here in the Tenda Life community. And you're an existing Tenda Lifer, you already get it, you already know the drill, you already know what it is we do here. So I hope you're all having a good start to your morning or to your day or whenever you're tuning in because I know you're in all different time zones. But the case I want to talk to you about today is one that happened relatively recently, back in 2015. You see, in April of 2015, Stephanie Scott's life was basically just the beginning. She was living in Leeton, Australia, and she was working her absolute dream job teaching English and drama at the local high school. She was also set to marry her soulmate named Aaron, and this wedding was set to take place on April 11, 2015. However, on Easter Sunday, just days before her big day, she went to the school to prepare some last-minute lesson plans before she took some time off to go to her wedding and then to her honeymoon, and she figured she would be the only person at school that day. But little did she know that someone that she worked with had actually been closely following her and was watching her that very day. When she didn't return home that night, her fiancé Aaron became worried and eventually called the police. Then a search ensued for this missing teacher in a very small and quiet town. Most people felt safe in this town, but that would soon change when they discovered that a monster had actually been living among them. So guys, let's jump right in. Alright, you guys know that I cannot live without my games on my phone. It's what I do to just unwind after a long day, kind of relax, and I need to share with you my new favorite. It is called Huge Casino. Emphasis on the U. Huge Casino. And it is huge, guys. Now, it's free to download on iOS and on Android. Now, the game does not offer real money gambling or an opportunity to win real money to real prizes. It's for entertainment only. Now, what I love is when you sign up, you get a welcome bonus of five. 5 million chips. Now, when I said huge, guys, I mean huge because this game offers over 100 online casino games, from retro classics to modern slot machines, all inspired by real slots. And on top of slots, you can also play poker, roulette, baccarat, and blackjack. I mean, there's literally something for everybody. For me, I love the slots. Specifically, I love the diamond slots because if I can be bougie, I'm gonna be bougie. I can't be bougie in real life, why not do it on the slots? It is my absolute favorite because I feel like every time I play, I'm winning bonuses and that just makes me very, very happy. So let's try again right now. Bam, another bonus. I am telling you guys, I don't know if it's ASMR. Actually, I know it's not ASMR, but there is something very soothing to me about like the rotation of the slots every time they click. I just honestly can't get enough of it. Four million, four million guys. Now, like I said, I do this to just unwind, relax, kind of have some time to myself. So you can either play by yourself or you could join a club to play with your friends and compete in the billionaire league. I mean, there are a lot of options. So download Huge Casino from the link in my description and make sure you use that link because it really does help the channel out if you use the direct link. Then once you do, I want you to come back, comment your favorite slot, what you're playing, what you love, are you playing the diamond one too? Download Huge Casino for free and get 5 million chips. And remember, use my direct link because it does help the channel. All right, I'm going back to playing, guys. Stephanie Scott was born on October 14th, 1988 in Sydney, Australia. She was the fourth child of her parents, Bob and Merrill, and although born in Sydney, Stephanie actually grew up in the town of Canoundra, and she grew up there with her two brothers, Gordon and Stuart, and two sisters, Kim and Robin. Now, all of these siblings were very, very close, and they actually lovingly nicknamed Stephanie Button Nose. As a child, Stephanie was very bubbly, she had a unique, funny, infectious laugh, and her sister lovingly referred to that laugh as Stephanie's cackle, 
which maybe not so lovingly, but you know, still a good descriptor nonetheless. And Stephanie was, as cliche as it sounds, described as the definition of fun and a light. And she also really enjoyed pulling pranks on all of her siblings. She was just this generally, naturally happy and upbeat person. She also loved fashion. She always knew the latest going on with the trends. She enjoyed gardening. She would often send her siblings pictures of this little garden that she had made. She was just full of life really happy and really close with her family. Now in high school, Stephanie met a boy named Aaron Leeson Woolley. Aaron was known around the school too. He was known as a very talented athlete and he was often praised for his skill on the soccer field. I mean, he was a jock, so to say. Stephanie also played soccer too, so the two of them really bonded over their love of this sport. Now while Stephanie was impressed with his athletic abilities, like everybody else was, she also saw so much more in him. She recognized how kind, personable, and considerate he really was. So the two of them spent a lot of time together, even working at the same grocery store together throughout high school. Stephanie loved spending time with Aaron, and her family really loved Aaron too. Her father, Bob, actually worked at the school that the two of them attended, and he was incredibly impressed not only with Aaron's athleticism, but also with how good of a person he really was. The two of them balanced each other out too because Stephanie was loud, excitable, and talkative, while Aaron was more reserved and more quiet and calm. So although they really did like each other and they bonded and got along great, they actually just stayed friends for a really long time before they ultimately ended up dating. Then, after high school, and on Aaron's 21st birthday to be exact, the two of them officially became a couple. After graduating high school, Stephanie was accepted into a teaching program at Charles Stewart University, which is in a town called Wagga Wagga. Now, Stephanie had always dreamed of following in her father's footsteps and becoming a teacher just like him. So getting accepted into this program was a very good opportunity and Stephanie could not wait to start college. She was so excited. But the one thing that she wasn't excited about was having to part ways with Aaron and be apart from him. You see, Wagga Wagga is about a three hour drive from where they lived, but the two of them really cared about each other, so they were determined to make it work. Stephanie knew that Aaron was her soulmate, and she wasn't going to end their relationship over something so small as long distance. While in college, Stephanie had numerous friends because her warm and inviting personality really made making friends easy for her. She also played on the school soccer team, and she wore the jersey number 10. Her coach said that Stephanie was actually the heart of the team, and she ended up being the captain of the team for three years. So Stephanie was really busy with college life. She was busy with school, with friends, with soccer, but she still always made time for Aaron. They would talk on the phone and they would drive to each other whenever they could. And the distance actually kind of had the reverse effect of what it has for most people, and it didn't break their relationship. It caused their relationship to grow even stronger. After graduating from university, Stephanie received a teaching job at a local high school in the small town of Leeton. Now, Leeton was very, very small and also kind of like a rural farming community, and it was on the southern part of New South Wales, Australia. The town itself was quiet, was humble, and the smell of the citrus from the local orange groves really just like filled the air. It was this beautiful town. The town's population was also only about 10,000, and along with all of that citrus, what they're known for and that smell, it was also known as the rice capital of Australia. And it was such a small town that crime was very, very minimal. The town too had so many charming qualities that we usually associate with small town living where everyone knew each other, everyone was looking out for each other, things like that. Now, Leeton was only a three hour drive from her family in Canoundra, and her parents really took comfort in the fact that she was only a car ride away. But this time, Aaron didn't stay in Canoundra, and he moved to Leeton with Stephanie where he secured a job as a butcher at a local meat shop. So let's talk a little bit more about Stephanie. Stephanie had the perfect personality to be a teacher. She really did. She was bubbly, she was funny, and it really resonated because her students absolutely loved her. She taught English and drama, and she quickly became admired in the school by not only the students, but also the teachers. Her colleagues really admired her strong work ethic and also her ability to just connect with the students. And her students loved how understanding and empathetic she was. They never worried that Stephanie would judge them, and they would actually often come to her for advice. Everything seemed to just be going really well. There was this couple, they were in love with each other, they were starting off in their career super strong, and in the spring of 2014, Stephanie and Aaron took a trip to Thailand. 
they had both been working extremely hard and they were settling into their life in Leeton and they wanted this really romantic getaway, just the two of them. Now, Stephanie's sister Kim had a feeling that this was more than just your average vacation. She even texted Stephanie at one point saying, I don't know why I'm sending you this, but I feel like something really special is going to happen. And something did happen that was very special, in fact. Because on April 11th, 2014, while Stephanie and Aaron were enjoying a very romantic dinner together, in the middle of that dinner, Aaron dropped to one knee and he asked Stephanie to marry him. Now, Stephanie was very shocked by this, but so excited, eagerly saying yes. She later sent a picture to her family displaying the ring on her finger and sharing the news of their engagement. She was so excited. So the couple set their wedding date for exactly one year later. April 11th, 2015. Stephanie was like any woman probably on the planet, and not all women, but I would say the majority, and she really threw herself into the wedding planning, and she poured over every single detail. The last thing that she wanted was for her wedding to be boring or be average. She wanted the wedding to be creative, and she wanted it to be a reflection of who she and Aaron were. So she actually made a lot of the decorations herself to ensure that the wedding would actually be personal and be really unique. Stephanie addressed each invitation herself, and in the months leading up to the big day, the couple practiced their first dance, which was going to be to the song Making Memories of Us by Keith Urban, a song that apparently they sang to each other often. Now, Stephanie meticulously planned all of the details of their wedding and even their Tahiti honeymoon. She became more and more excited as the wedding day quickly approached, as any normal bride would. She was now going to be marrying her soulmate, while also being surrounded by her closest family and friends. I mean, how could she not be happy, right? So on Easter weekend in 2015, Stephanie and Aaron were invited to a party back in Canoundra. One of their friends would actually be moving away, so there was a farewell party being thrown in their honor. But Stephanie said that she could not go because their wedding was only a week away, and then after the wedding, they'd be gone on their honeymoon to Tahiti, so she had a lot of things to do. A substitute teacher was going to be covering her classes while she was away, so Stephanie had to make sure that the lesson plans were finished for the substitute teacher and just really get things in order. She just had too much to do and too much on her plate. So she told Aaron, hey, go to the party by yourself, enjoy spending time with the friends, and have a good time. So Aaron drove to this party, and he went to the party on Saturday, April 4th. He spent the night at his parents' house, and he and Stephanie stayed in contact the entire time that they were away from each other. They texted, they talked on the phone, and they also made plans to have dinner together at one of their favorite restaurants on Sunday night when he returned. So Aaron went ahead and made those reservations for that restaurant before then telling Stephanie, "Good night. I'm going to sleep. I love you. We'll talk tomorrow. The next morning on April 5th, Stephanie woke up and she decided that she needed to go to the school to get some of that work done. She needed to be in the office in her classroom to really get things truly buttoned up. Now, although it was Easter Sunday and she could have taken that day to relax and be with her family, be with her friends, be with Aaron, Stephanie was very responsible and she wanted to get everything in place for that substitute teacher. So she arrived at the school at around 11 a.m. and she parked her red Mazda on the street near a coworker's house. She had texted this coworker earlier that morning, in fact, and asked if she could borrow her key to the school because Stephanie didn't have one herself. So she met up with her coworker, the pair of them unlocked the school front gate together, and then entered the school courtyard. Stephanie then relocked the gate behind them, and the pair entered the school together. Now, Stephanie then headed alone to the staff workroom, where she began working on her laptop to get things in order. And she worked for about three hours. She was finishing her substitute plans. She was planning more parts of her wedding that needed like the final details for the specific day. And she also was answering her emails. The last email that she sent was around 1 p.m. and it was to a bus company. She confirmed that they were going to be picking up the guests from the hotel and then bringing them to the venue on the day of the wedding. Just all of the last minute details that go into the planning. Aaron had received a text message from Stephanie that morning telling him that she would be working at the school and finishing up all of the last minute things. So Aaron said goodbye to his family and then he started driving back home to Leeton. But as the day went on, Aaron didn't receive any more text messages from Stephanie. So we tried calling her once, but she didn't answer. Now this was a little odd because like most couples, the two were used to engaging in text messages all throughout the day, but Aaron tried not to worry about it and just kind of figure that Stephanie was probably working hard, trying to really get everything nailed down and settled, not paying attention to her phone and really focused. He figured he would see her in just a couple hours when he got home from the drive and he didn't really put too much weight into it. But once Aaron finally arrived home that evening, Stephanie nor her car were at the house. 
So Erin was worried, but again, tried to be positive and just assumed that Stephanie was just still so busy with work, or that maybe she was with a friend or she was doing something last minute for the wedding. But as time went on and he still didn't hear from Stephanie, he started to get really concerned. He ended up canceling those dinner reservations that he had made earlier, and then he started calling Stephanie's friends. He asked if any of them had seen her or had been with her that day, but nobody had heard from her. He called as many people as he could think of who might have seen her that day, who may have talked to her, but he wasn't getting any answers. So this only made Aaron more worried, and then he began driving his car around the town looking for any sign of Stephanie, and he couldn't find her anywhere. Now, although Stephanie said that she drove to the school that morning, her car wasn't outside of the school because remember, she parked at that coworker's house. So when he went to the school, he couldn't find her car anywhere, and he couldn't find it anywhere around town. So then he had no other choice but to go home and wait. So he went home and he just waited, but he didn't get any sleep that night because he just laid in bed, staring at a picture of Stephanie, listening for any sound that might indicate that she was home, a key rattling in the door, the door opening, anything, but there was nothing. He waited for a call, a text, or for Stephanie herself just to walk into their bedroom, but none of that came. So his panic was rising. And then the next morning, Aaron knew he had to tell Stephanie's parents about her being missing and what was going on because something wasn't right here. When he called them, they hoped that Stephanie just got herself into some type of silly situation and that she would walk in the door any minute and then they would all laugh about it and make fun of it in the future and it would kind of just be one of those staple stories that you always hang on to. But that didn't happen. They all continued to call Stephanie and her phone would ring and ring and ring Until eventually, the ringing stopped completely, and the phone calls just started going straight to voicemail. And it was almost like her phone had died, or maybe that it had been turned off completely. So then they started checking her social media accounts, and they found that she hadn't posted anything there either. So Aaron and Stephanie's parents decided now it was time to contact the police. I mean, while they were trying to stay positive about the situation, it had gotten to the point where they knew that something was seriously wrong, so they didn't have any other options. They reported Stephanie as a missing person, and then a search ensued for her. Now, with Leeton being such a small and close-knit town, word got out about Stephanie's disappearance pretty quickly, and many people in the community started searching for her. Stephanie's brother, Stuart, also posted about Stephanie's disappearance on his Facebook page, and the post was being shared left and right. I mean, within the first day, the post was shared over 1,500 times. Her picture was also being shared everywhere, along with a message stating to be on the lookout for Stephanie, for Stephanie's car, which was a red Mazda sedan, and it had the license plate of BZ19CD. They had her picture in the newspaper, on the news, and the town was just really coming together and frantically searching for Stephanie. And footage was pulled of her last known whereabouts, and Stephanie was seen on footage driving and entering the school, but then she isn't seen any time afterward. It was like she just completely vanished. So two days passed without a word from Stephanie or a single clue as to where she might have gone. So feeling more desperate and concerned, the police started knocking on doors and asking if anyone had seen Stephanie that day or if they had seen anything out of the ordinary. Aaron also checked Stephanie's bank account and he didn't find any suspicious activity. She hadn't withdrawn cash or used her card since before her disappearance. So Stephanie's family, along with the public, started urging the public to check alongside the roads for her. Maybe there had been an accident, maybe she had gotten into a car accident, and some suggested that she might have crashed her car into a body of water that was nearby, which apparently had happened in the area before. So they brought in a helicopter to search overhead for her car, people were riding on bikes on nearby trails, and everywhere you looked, People were out looking for Stephanie, looking for something. As their search continued with no real answers, people started coming up with answers on their own. And of course, like in many cases, people started suspecting Aaron. They thought that maybe he wasn't feeling confident about the wedding after all, and maybe he was planning on getting rid of Stephanie as his way out. But everyone that was close to the family knew that that was not the case, because Aaron wasn't even in Leeton the day that Stephanie went missing, and he loved her way too much to ever hurt her. So then people started saying and changing the narrative that maybe Stephanie was the one that got cold feet. Maybe she got nervous, and maybe she was a runaway bride. But again, everybody who was close to Stephanie knew that this would not be the case. And these rumors kind of got so out of hand that Aaron ended up publicly speaking out, in which he said, it's hard hearing that she might have gotten cold feet. I know she wouldn't have gotten cold feet. 
And Stephanie's sister Kim agreed with him on this because the day before she went missing on Saturday, Kim had talked to Stephanie on the phone. And according to Kim, Stephanie was just like over the moon and so excited for the wedding, so excited for the honeymoon. I mean, yeah, she did have a lot on her plate at the moment, but she wasn't overly stressed. She was just excited. She was running off of that energy, that pure excitement, adrenaline. She wouldn't have gotten cold feet and just ran away. Plus, with no activity from her bank account, it was highly unlikely that she would just be able to disappear without using any money, right? So her family continued spreading their message on social media, asking anybody for help searching for Stephanie. People were coming from other towns, they were driving slowly along the roads, looking for any sign of her, any evidence, any lead at all. Aaron would go on the local news, he would answer any question that people asked him, even if they were asking him in a accusatory way. He always stayed as calm as he could, and he said he didn't have anything to hide. He just wanted to find Stephanie. He didn't even care what the public thought of him. He just wanted Stephanie found. Now, Aaron's story about the weekend and his relationship with Stephanie was consistent too, so people started recognizing him as a man who was truly worried and truly heartbroken. So the community's suspicion of him finally began to subside a bit. But the rumor that Stephanie was a runaway bride, that one was spreading. And the story at this point had actually captured the nation's attention. And major news outlets were now reporting on Stephanie's disappearance. And many of them were circulating the rumor that Stephanie got cold feet and just ran away. But as time went on, Aaron and Stephanie's family, the ones who actually knew her, who knew that she wouldn't have just run away, they began to accept that more than likely, something more sinister probably happened to Stephanie. Police began questioning community members and Stephanie's co-workers, and they received extremely important tips from two separate people. The first told police that on the Sunday that Stephanie went missing, he saw something that seemed really off. He saw a man wearing sunglasses and a baseball hat walking alongside a canal, and then he saw that man throw some sort of electronic device into the water. He said it looked like an iPad, but he couldn't be sure. The second witness said that he saw a man wearing a t-shirt and a backpack walking along Griffith Road. And he said that this was odd because that was a road that typically people would not walk on. Now, because Stephanie was at school on Easter Sunday, many of her colleagues were ruled out as suspects because the majority of them were at the school that day. They noted that the alarm on Stephanie's classroom was disarmed around 1.31 p.m., but then it was set again at 1.38 p.m. One colleague said that they had heard strange noises around 2 p.m., but they thought nothing of it. Another said that they noticed Stephanie's car early in the day and then noticed it was gone when they left that afternoon. Another colleague said that they saw the janitor's vehicle parked in the school parking lot. And then a different colleague said that they had a strange conversation with that school janitor the following Monday. Apparently, the coworker and the janitor were talking about Stephanie, and the coworker had asked the janitor if he thought that Stephanie had gotten cold feet and had run away. And the janitor then giggled and just said no. So obviously, Stephanie's coworker thought this response was really odd and also kind of noted that the janitor had scratch marks on his face during this conversation. So hearing this, the police asked the school's janitor, who happened to be 24-year-old Vincent Stanford, to come to the station so they could ask him some questions. Vincent went in for questioning and said that he did see Stephanie that day, but only briefly. He wasn't scheduled to work that day, but knew that the garbage bins needed to be cleaned out, and he wanted to get ahead of his work, so that's why he went in. He recounted his timeline of events that day, too, saying that he left the school around sometime around 3.30 p.m. before going to Golden Apple Superstore, which is a grocery store nearby. So police obtained this footage, and it showed Vincent driving away from the school around the time he said he was. Now, at the end of his interview, Vincent told the officers, you know, hey, good luck with your search before ultimately leaving. But something still felt off about Vincent. So officers went to the Golden Apple Superstore, and they asked employees if Vincent had been at the store on Easter Sunday. But he wasn't at the store. In fact, nobody was at the store, because it actually had been closed for the holiday. So it didn't make sense for Vincent to lie about something like this. And then that detail and that lie, of course, further confirmed the police's suspicions of Vincent. So a few hours later, at 6 p.m., officers went to Vincent's house, and they wanted to ask him to come back to the station for another round of questioning. Vincent's mother answered the door and said that Vincent wasn't home, but she also said that the police could search the house if they wanted to. So investigators took this opportunity, and they searched the home and they found a red and white lanyard that matched the description of Stephanie's. They also found a red bra in Vincent's bedroom and tire marks outside of the house that didn't match his car. They also found the trunk liner of Stephanie's car. 
So as this search is going down, Vincent ends up arriving back home at around 7.30 p.m. And he calmly told the investigators that he had been out taking photos. And he didn't even seem phased that multiple officers were parked outside of his house and were also inside his house searching. Officers asked to see his digital camera that he said he was out taking photos with, and they expected to find pictures of animals and nature, something like that. Instead, they found pictures of what looked to be a burned body. And Vincent just handed them this camera like it was nothing. He said that they were pictures that he downloaded from a horror movie. But the police were not dumb. I mean, why would you take pictures from a movie, download them online, and then upload them to your camera? I mean, it didn't make any sense. And the police actually knew what and more likely who they were looking at in these photos. So on the evening of April 9th, 2015, Vincent was arrested and he was charged with the murder of Stephanie Scott. Now, it is fairly unusual for someone to be arrested for murder before a body is found, but the Leeton police felt that they had enough evidence to arrest Vincent. Hours after Vincent was arrested, Stephanie's car was finally also found, and it was about seven miles south of Leeton in this open, grassy field, but they still had not found her body. It was soon public knowledge that someone had been arrested for the murder of Stephanie, and it was eventually released that Vincent had been the one to be arrested. And while many people knew of Vincent, because it was a small town after all, nobody really knew anything about him specifically. Even the people who worked with him didn't know much about him. Employees and students from the high school said that Vincent mostly kept to himself and they very rarely ever heard him say anything. People in the community said that they would see Vincent walking around the town, but he would be walking around with his head down, and he also never would say anything. They would never talk to him. Vincent had recently arrived in the area of Leeton in the past year or so, and he had moved in with his mother and his older brother Luke from Holland. They moved to be closer to Vincent's twin, Marcus, who lived in southern Australia. You see, Vincent was born in Australia, but then later moved to Denmark when he was very, very young and lived the majority of his life there. He had also worked as a janitor in Denmark, and this experience is what helped him get the job at the new high school. However, although he seemed to be a career janitor at the time, his biggest dream was to be able to make money as an online gamer. His brother Marcus worked in the gaming industry, and Vincent had hoped that moving near Marcus would help him become a paid gamer. He loved to play fantasy video games, and he opted to spend most of his free time in the online world rather than in the real world. So like I said, Vincent's arrest really shocked the community because their small and cozy town kind of now took on a much darker air. Previously, the worst crime that had been committed in the area was vandalism, so many people were now starting to feel way less safe in this town. The community also was deeply mourning the loss of Stephanie, and many memorials were now being held in her honor. Stephanie's favorite color was yellow, so people were wearing yellow shirts, yellow ribbons, and yellow balloons were put everywhere that you could see across town. It was all yellow. And ribbons and balloons were also hung all around the high school, as Stephanie's students were now mourning the loss of their bright, bubbly, and trusted teacher who they just bonded with and loved so much. On April 10th, the day after Vincent's arrest, investigators made very important discoveries. Now, remember the witness who said that he saw a man throw an iPad into that canal? Well, the police decided to follow up with this lead and to search that canal. And coincidentally, the canal was near the area where Stephanie's car was found. In the canal, the police found a laptop computer that would later be identified as Vincent's laptop. Police also obtained Vincent's phone, and a search of the two devices would uncover some very disturbing evidence. On both devices, Vincent had hundreds of pictures of women and young girls from across town. He had been following them without their knowledge and had been taking photos of them. He had numerous pictures of female students from the high school and also pictures and videos depicting bestiality. If you don't know what bestiality is, guys, I'm not going to tell you here. Google it. It's gross. I probably will get flagged if I describe it in here. But imagine explicit images from, you know, two consenting adults that you would find on the internet. You know what I'm talking about. You go to one of these sites. It has a hub at the end of it and you see all of this. Videos, explicit images, all of the things. Imagine that. But instead of two humans with each other, it's a human and an animal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm pretty gross, right? Makes you want to throw up? I know. 
So he had pictures and videos depicting this on his phone. So investigators spoke with Vincent's mother and older brother Luke, who were apparently both suspicious of Vincent. However, many still wondered if these two actually knew more about what Vincent had done. So police used Vincent's phone to track his location on the day of Stephanie's disappearance. They also still had Vincent's camera, and they were using the phone's location and the pictures from the camera to help them locate Stephanie's body. The picture of that burned body had been taken outside in some sort of grassy area. So investigators started searching areas that had that same type of vegetation from the pictures, and eventually Stephanie's body was found. It was found 40 miles from the high school in an area called Cocopara National Park. Now, Cocopara was a very popular spot for the Leeton residents to go and to hike and to spend time outdoors. And based on the pictures found on Vincent's camera, officers suspected that this was where Stephanie might be found. And turns out they were right. So they had now found Stephanie's body, and it was very, very badly burned. So they secured the crime scene while the other investigators took Stephanie's body to be forensically analyzed. And then nearby, officers also found several cans of gasoline. The next day on April 11th, it was supposed to be Stephanie and Aaron's wedding day. So across Australia, other brides ended up actually tying yellow ribbons to their bouquets in honor of Stephanie. And many wedding guests to these ceremonies wore yellow ribbons in memory of her. Posts in honor of Stephanie were flooding social media everywhere, and women across Australia all started posting pictures on social media of their wedding dresses with the hashtags Remember Stephanie, and also the hashtag Put Your Dress Out. Stephanie would never get to wear her wedding dress. So, in a really beautiful sentiment, women hung their dress outside in honor of her. I mean, it was pretty unreal the way this community all came together trying to honor, grieve, and pay respect to Stephanie. What was supposed to be the happiest day of Aaron's life was now the worst day of his life. So the family invited community members to meet at a local park where they ended up holding a memorial service for Stephanie. They shared a post on social media that stated, Tomorrow should have been the happiest day of Stephanie and Aaron's lives. To help all of us through this difficult time, we invite everyone to join us at Mountford Park Leeton tomorrow for a lunchtime affair to celebrate the life of our button nose. Everybody who attended wore yellow, and the service actually started at the same time that their wedding ceremony was scheduled to start. Stephanie's father, Rob, spoke on behalf of the family about how happy, lively, and how fun Stephanie was. Stephanie's sister, Kim, read a poem that she had actually written for Stephanie and Aaron's wedding day, and part of the poem read, They make each other smile. They can fill a room with love, joking and laughing. They fit each other like a glove. You're beautiful people when you stand alone. Together you're strong. You set the tone. I wish you all happiness for the many years to come. May you fill each other with joy and never be glum. I'm sure you'd all agree that their bond is unique, special, and happy. Their love is what we seek. So Aaron sat nearby in tears as friends and family tried to comfort him. The family displayed incredible strength throughout all of this because their beloved family member had been murdered, but the family stood together firmly, and they welcomed anybody and everybody who came to attend this picnic memorial service. Many of Stephanie's students attended the memorial, and some spoke about what a great teacher she was. They talked about how excited she was for her wedding day and how she made learning fun. She wasn't afraid to be silly or make a fool of herself during drama class. She was just Stephanie. And many students shared that Stephanie was their favorite teacher and that she actually made them excited to come to school. She provided a place of comfort for them. And many considered Stephanie to be like a close friend or even an older sister that you could tell anything to. She was always there for them, providing them with guidance, insight, boost of confidence, and simple moments to just brighten their day. In Stephanie's class, students felt a little more like a family. Rob and Stephanie's sister gave these students a little bit of hope by saying, Just remember what my beautiful sister loved, teaching all of you amazing students and seeing your smiling faces. You are the ones who made her want to be the most amazing teacher, friend, and person that she could be. Be strongly in, for Steph, and know that she will be with all of you in spirit as I know she is with her family and friends. So the residents of Leeton were forever changed by this horrific tragedy. Many now lived in fear, suffering from panic attacks, sleepless nights, and nightmares. 
the horrible tragedy kind of cast this lingering shadow on this small town. The once vibrant community now carried an air of just kind of like unease, as if the very essence of the town had just shifted into more of a horrific state ever since this crime occurred. But her death didn't just shock this small town, it actually shocked the entire nation. All across Australia, people were mourning the murder of Stephanie. Her story was all over the news, and even some professional soccer teams started wearing yellow jerseys to support her. Her old soccer coach from college, Stephen Waite, also announced that Stephanie's old jersey number, number 10, was going to be retired. So all of this was great with the memorial, the unity within the community, all of these things, but there was still that huge question. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Why would Vincent murder Stephanie? What was the motive here? And what they were going to find was going to not only make this crime 20 times worse, but it was going to make the haunting of this crime in this town just truly revolting and unimaginable. So police continued to question Vincent, who still remained in custody. And that's when they learned more about his life before arriving in Leeton. They discovered that Vincent had actually had a pretty troubling childhood, often displaying fits of anger and behavior issues, and even choked a teacher at just 12 years old. He would later admit that he actually started thinking about killing people when he was just seven years old. His classmates, rightfully so in my opinion, referred to him as a psycho because of how violent he was. During school, he would just like sit silently and then he would lose his temper, throwing things all around the classroom. After moving to Denmark, Vincent and his twin brother Marcus were bullied relentlessly for their Australian accents. And even though the two were bigger than the majority of their classmates, they would never fight back against the bullies. So eventually though, Vincent's violent outbursts then caused him to be sent to a special school for kids, one for kids with behavior issues. And then he was actually even sent to a psychiatric facility for adolescents. He was diagnosed with autism and oppositional defiance disorder, which is a disorder that causes children to be defiant and hostile toward peers, teachers, parents, and other authority figures. He had wanted to join the army or go to college for information technology, but he was actually ultimately rejected from both. His brother, meanwhile, had started that gaming company, Bulletproof Studios, and Vincent did some programming for it. But the company didn't last long and Vincent ended up having to find work elsewhere. So he worked various jobs and at one point he worked at a packaging facility where coworkers gave him the nickname King Kong. You see, he was so strong that he could apparently pick up multiple packages with just one hand, as if they weighed absolutely nothing, like filled with air. His neighbors in Leeton had noted that Vincent and his mom were both very quiet, but also both very close. Vincent gave most of his money to his mother, as a matter of fact, to help pay for the bills, and the two often played games together in the backyard. So how Vincent got to the high school, he was initially hired on on a five-week contract, and the contract had been extended just before he killed Stephanie. He apparently took his work very seriously too and meticulously cleaned throughout the school. He worked really hard, but felt like this work went unnoticed by his supervisor. And apparently that really angered Vincent. Vincent often thought about actually hurting his supervisor. Vincent had very limited access to the school and he wasn't allowed at the school on weekends, but somehow he had obtained the school's master key and also the code to the school's alarm system. And what's interesting about this is he wasn't even supposed to be at the school during school hours. He was supposed to complete his work before school started or after it ended, but he was often at school during the school day. So police found out that Vincent was known to lurk in the girls' bathroom at the school, and they found that he had seriously been stalking a 12-year-old student during this kind of like lurking behavior. He would take pictures of her, and he would follow her home. And he had taken over 1,800 pictures of this young 12-year-old girl. They also obtained a journal of his where he went in great detail about when the girl was home, who was home with her, when she was home alone, and in one entry, he actually noted that she was home alone for 40 minutes, which, quote unquote, was enough time to abduct. He had written down the license plate of all of her family cars and the names of the drugs that he could use to drug this small 12-year-old girl and take her, basically, without her being conscious. So investigators figured that this girl was likely going to be Vincent's first victim. And Vincent even said later on that he would have killed this girl if he had abducted her. But for whatever reason, he couldn't go through with his plans. And he decided to then set his sights on Stephanie instead. 
So as they're still piecing together the motive, the details, what really happened, how this happened, the forensics team identified Stephanie's cause of death, and it was identified as blunt force trauma, and they also found that she had been sexually violated. She was hit in the head over 40 times. She was stabbed in the neck, her body was dumped, it was then covered in gasoline, and then it was set on fire. Now, Vincent ended up being very forthcoming in his police interviews, and eventually fully admitted to murdering Stephanie, although he did not admit to sexually violating her. Now, in a recorded confession, Vincent went into detail about what occurred the day that he murdered Stephanie. Vincent had gone into work that day because he just felt like working, apparently. And when he first saw Stephanie, she was in the staff lounge doing some work on her computer. He was using a pressure washer to clean those garbage bins. But after seeing Stephanie, he had a compulsion to kill her. He wasn't sure why either. He says he didn't feel angry. He didn't feel anything like that. He just wanted to hurt her. Vincent told officers that he likely had mental problems, which was why he was feeling this way. He stopped what he was doing, and he went home to grab what he referred to as a sex assault kit. In the kit, there was a knife, there was Viagra, there was handcuffs, and there were cleaning products. And Stephanie's DNA was later found all over these handcuffs. So as he was driving back to the school, he used his phone to search things like bride sexual R-A-P-E, bride harmed in wedding gown, and also searches related to necrophilia. When he got back to the school, he noticed that Stephanie was getting ready to leave. And as she was leaving, she passed Vincent. She smiled and she said, hey, I'm going now, have a good Easter. She then stopped to look in her purse for her keys. And Vincent took that opportunity to attack her from behind. He wrapped one arm around her torso and the other around her mouth before dragging her into a storage closet. Stephanie fought back violently, even scratching Vincent's face, which remember, those scratches were later seen. But unfortunately, he was just too strong. He hit her in the head over and over until she was dead and then bleeding out on the storage room floor. And after this, Vincent apparently, in a sociopathic moment, in my opinion, decided that this would be the perfect time for him to go home and make himself a sandwich. So he left Stephanie on the floor of this storage room, and he actually went home so that he could eat. Then after having a sandwich and a coffee, he went back to the school where he got the keys to Stephanie's car, and he put her body in the trunk of her car. He cleaned the blood from the storage closet as best as he could, and then he drove her car to his house. He talked to his mom and his brother for a little bit, and then he waited until the early morning hours of Monday morning to leave again. Around 2 a.m., he got back into Stephanie's car and he drove to the National Park. He dumped Stephanie's body, he covered it in gasoline, and then he set it on fire. Okay, so when you've taken her out of the boot, did you take the clothes off her in the boot or did you take clothes off her in the ground? On the ground. On the ground? Yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, she had, at this stage, there was a lot of blood and did she have injuries to her face? Did you notice any swelling or...? Yeah, the right side of her face. Yep, it's quite... Up near her eye. Yep, and that's from when you punched her when she was yeah. around? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you said you threw some wood on her? Or yeah. branches and stuff, and then did you put the fuel on after that, or did you put the fuel on before? After that. After that, okay. And you've put her clothes back in the car? Yeah. Yep, in the boot. Okay, so... Then you've, what did you, did you use match to light the fire or did you use cigarettes? Put some petrol on a stick and I lit a match on that. Yep. And I chucked the stick on there. Yep. And where did the match, what about the match, where did you put it? I think it's still there, probably. Did you throw that in the fire or just drop it? No, I dropped it where the stick was. Okay. Is that far away from the body or? No. No? No. Okay. Um... So when you travelled, after, did you stay around long to watch your body burn? Or? No, I left straight away. You left straight away? Now, so was it well light? Was the body well light when you left or you didn't take much notice? Or? Yeah, it was well light. It took a second. Petrol starts fast. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you travelled home. Which way did you go home? S same route. Same route? Yeah. I think I went in put our car on Pike Road. Yep. And then walk the rest of the way back home. 
Did you sexually assault Stephanie? No. While she was alive? No. Or deceased? No. Okay. When you took her out to Kokopara National Park, are you able to tell me the time that you took her out there? The time I got there it might have been 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. in the morning. Okay. And whereabouts, you say near Jack's Creek, can you describe for me the, the, the precise location near Jack's Creek that you put her body? If you drive past Jack's Creek, but don't go into it, somewhere between 10 and 15 metres on the left hand side, there's a clearing with a fallen over tree where her body was. Okay. And you, you, you say you used petrol? Yes. Did you um, place any did you place any timber under or over her or anything like that? Yes. Okay, where, where did you place the timber? Under or On top of her. Sorry? On top, On of, top her. of her. Okay. And how big was the fire? It was quite large. Did it burn any other area there? Is there any other area? Burning? No, I think just the immediate surrounding, but not a whole lot. Okay. Um, did, how long did you stay there for while her body was burning? I left straight away. And where did you go then? To bike road to park her car. Okay. On your camera, you had two photos of a deceased body. Yes. Are, they, are those photographs of Stephanie? Yes. Can you tell me why you took those photographs of Stephanie? No. Okay, so can you can you just outline your movements on Sunday for me with the, in relation to the school, when you got there, how long you were there, and and like when you met Stephanie. Okay, I went to the high school at about seven thirty, worked for a couple of hours, when she was ready to leave at about eleven thirty, I took her into the store and killed her. I parked. I put her into the trunk of her car. I got the high pressure cleaner out, cleaned the high school and her blood. I drove her car to my house, parked it behind the shed so nobody would see. Went about my day and at about 1 p 1 a.m. Monday morning, I left the Copacabana National Park. At about 2 p.m. I dumped her there and burned her. I drove back to Pike Road, put her car there and I walked home. Now you, we, we spoke to you on um, Wednesday night, on the 8th. Yes. And we spoke to you about certain scratches that I can still see on your face. Yes. Now. Can you tell me where you got those scratches from? Several of them are from Stephanie Scott. And how, how did she do that? With her fingernails. And when did she do that? When I tried to kill her. When I killed her. When you killed her? Yes. Okay, so you say that you've... Can you just tell me exactly what happened when she walked... See, when, when you first... You said you were waiting for her to come out, were you? You were waiting for her to finish her work? Yes. Okay. What exactly happened then? When she finished her work, what did you do? I picked her up from behind, with my right hand over her mouth and my left hand around her middle. I dragged her into the store. I closed the door behind us, chopped her on the floor, I beat her to death. You say with your fists? Yes. Did you use any other weapon? I did use a knife as well. A knife? Yes. A clip point knife. A oh, what? A clip point knife. What's a clip point knife? It's a knife that's angled from the top and again at the bottom. Sure. It should be at my house. Where was she when you first saw her? She was in the staff room upstairs for the English drama math teacher. Okay. What was she doing? She was working on a computer. Was the staff room door open, closed or...? Open. Where were you at that time then? I was working and had a pressure cleaner out to clean the garbage bins and put some of the garbage bins upstairs. That's when I saw her. In the class, in the staff room? Yes. Did you say anything to her at that time? No. Did she say anything to you? No. Did she see you? I think so. What do you mean you think so? I walked by the door so she probably knew I was there. But you didn't say anything to her? No. 
So what? So she, she's sitting in that room alone. Is that right? She in that? Yes. In the side room alone. Did she? Um, you say you got a feeling that you had to do it. What feeling? Can you describe that to me upon seeing her? What feeling came over you? Like what did you feel? Is that I had to kill her? I wasn't angry or anything. Basically emotionless, just that I had to kill her. Yep. Did you start waiting from that moment? No, I continued working. How long did you keep continue working till you just till you went and waited? Until she was ready to leave. How did you know she was ready to leave? She put the alarm on in the admin. She said she was leaving. She said she said yes. you. I was by the front gate at the time, so was she. That's when I picked her up at the, about 11.30, I think. Yep. She was walking towards the front gate. Towards you? Yes. Yep. And then I grabbed her. Did she, where, where did she speak to you? Said she speak. When she was walking away from Edmund towards the front gate. And what, what words did she say to you? I'm going, have a happy Easter. I'm going, have a happy Easter. Yes. Did she get past you, out, out of the... Did she get through the gate? No. No, you got her, you, you, and you said you grabbed her? Yes. Before she got out of the gate? Yes, the gate was locked. The gate was locked? Yes. Who locked the gate? I think she locked it behind her when she came in. Okay. Apart from um, the the episode that you started when you had me at 14 or 15 and you tried to strangle the school teacher yes. in Holland, have you had any other episode like that between then and, and this episode that happened on Sunday? I've had a lot of violent thoughts, but I've never acted on them. Okay. So when you say you've had a lot of violent thoughts, can you describe to me what those thoughts have been? I'm killing various people I've met. Yep. Hurting them. That's about it, really. And um, is there any reason why you wanted to kill these people or hurt these people? No, I think I might have some mental problems, but I've never done anything to me to deserve it. Are you going to tell me why you got angry at Stephanie and why you wanted to kill her? I didn't really feel anger, I just wanted to kill her. Oh, so you weren't, you didn't feel anger? No, I don't kind you of just wanted to kill her. Emotion. Okay, so you just wanted to kill her? Yes. Can you tell me why you wanted to kill her? No, I think I've just my mental health acting up again. Okay. My obsessions, rages. Police had discovered that Stephanie's clothing, her earrings, her graduation ring, and her engagement ring were missing. So they asked Vincent where these items were, and he commented, I don't know, I chucked so much stuff out. He said he remembered taking her ring off at the school, but he wasn't sure what he did with it because he was just scrambling to make sure that he didn't leave anything behind. Investigators then asked him why he kept Stephanie's bra, the one that they found in his room. And he said, I honestly don't know. Maybe I wanted a souvenir. I had no real reason to keep it. And as you may know, this is a fairly common practice among murderers. They often take something from the crime scene as a souvenir, a trophy, to just like commemorate what they did. What about her earrings engagement ring? I don't know, I might have taken that off earlier. Earlier? Where did you take those off? Probably when I was at home with her. And, no. When I went and collected all her stuff at the high school, would have been. Not her earrings, though. Put her engagement ring, you remember taking that? Yeah. And where did the you, high school. Where did you put her engagement ring? Don't know. Chuck so much stuff out. Yep. So you, you got rid of that with her clothes, did you? Or. I would have chucked it in a bin somewhere when I chucked everything else out, but... Okay. Okay, so, um, but you do remember taking an engagement ring off a finger? Yeah, she wore school. two rings. Wore two rings? On the same finger, were they, or...? No, on different fingers. Yeah, what fingers were they on, do you remember? On the no, right index finger and the other on the left, I think. Right index, or...? Nah, this one. Ring finger? What, yeah, yeah, ring fingers. Okay, so, and you took those off at the school? Yeah. When after you walked back or before you went home the first time? Um, before I went home, when I collected all her stuff, I think. Okay. Why did you take her engagement ring off then? I don't know, I was just scrounging up her stuff, make sure I didn't leave anything behind. Okay, so it was 
in her handbag in your cupboard then at some point, her engagement ring. Would have been, yeah. Yep. Do you remember when you went home that afternoon to go through with stuff? Did you remember seeing the engagement ring? Yeah, would have still been in the bag. Didn't, you didn't mention it before, that's all. You mentioned other things like her credit cards, wallet. I'm oh, sorry. Yep. So, you, you remember seeing it then? You remember seeing her engagement ring? Yeah, it would have been. Okay. Do you have any place where you may have stored some of um, Stephanie's belongings for later on, or have you stored them at the TAFE or the school or anywhere no. else? You disposed of them all? Yeah, just her bra that was in my bag. But yeah. Why, why, did, you, why did you keep the bra? Like you disposed of everything else, why the bra? I honestly don't know. Don't know? Maybe I wanted a souvenir. Yep. Yeah. Something to remember it by. Probably, but I had no real reason to keep yeah. it. Why the bra though? Why not any other item? I think it was clean. Did you wash the bra? I did chuck it in the washing once, yeah. At home or at school? At home. At home. Okay. When did you wash her bra? Tuesday afternoon, evening would have been. Okay. Her engagement ring, can you think where that would be? No. Was that in a bin? Would that, do you know if that was taken to a bin? Do you know if that was thrown out a window? Do you know? It would be in a bin somewhere, but I have no idea where. Which, you don't know which bin? No. A bin in Leeton or a bin in Griffith? In Leeton, probably. Probably? Yeah. Eventually, on June 3rd, Vincent was officially charged with sexually assaulting Stephanie along with murdering her. And then, as if it couldn't get any worse or there wasn't going to be another twist coming, seven days later, to the shock of the community, Vincent's twin brother Marcus was also arrested. He was arrested as an accomplice to the crime. Marcus lived in southern Australia and was first interviewed by police there on Tuesday, April 21st. He had said that he spoke to his brother on the phone on April 4th and then the next day on April 5th, the day that Stephanie was murdered. Marcus told the police that Vincent did sound weird on the phone, but he didn't think much of it. But he denied having any involvement in the crime. But police later found text messages on Vincent's phone that were sent to Marcus. And the messages read, I'm going to send you an envelope. Keep it safe for me. Can you let me know when you receive the envelope? And Vincent had placed Stephanie's engagement and graduation ring in that envelope and sent them to Marcus. A search of Marcus's computer found that he had actually been searching where to sell diamond rings and was searching how much money the rings would be worth. And then eventually on May 9th, he took those rings to a jewelry store and he sold them for $705. Now, unfortunately, the rings would later be melted down for scrap and metal and they couldn't be returned to Stephanie's family. Then, months later on August 5th, Marcus eventually admitted to receiving the rings in the mail, along with Stephanie's driver's license. He admitted to selling the rings, and that he used that money to travel and visit Vincent in prison. He also took a few pictures of Stephanie's driver's license before ultimately burning it. So police asked Marcus why he helped Vincent, and he stated that it was because of misplaced loyalty. Unfortunately, Vincent's court date wouldn't be for another year, and Stephanie's family continued to mourn the loss of their beloved family member. On October 14th, 2015, what would have been Stephanie's 27th birthday, her family took to social media and they asked the community to have a cuppa for Stephanie, forever 26, who knew on this day 27 years ago an angel like you would be born. Although you weren't a boy as dad first thought, we wouldn't have had you any other way. To say we were lucky is an understatement. To the girl who defines the word fun-loving, happy birthday. I'm proud to call you my little sister. And although you may not be here, I'm sure you'll be sprinkling a few hundreds and thousands in heaven today. A year later, in October of 2016, Vincent finally appeared in court. He pleaded guilty to murdering and sexually assaulting Stephanie, even though he had initially denied ever sexually attacking her. At his sentencing hearing, Stephanie's mother read a very moving victim's impact statement. I'm not going to read the entire statement, but there are a few key pieces that I did want to read. There were no vows exchanged, no wedding dance performed, no celebration with family and friends. Stephanie spent her wedding day alone in the cold sterility of the Griffith morgue. Instead of enjoying every moment of her evening with loved ones, Stephanie was on the long and lonely journey to meet with the coroner. 
Her ordeal was coming to a close. Ours was just the beginning. Our lives have been shattered. How could this happen to our beautiful girl? So much time and effort is involved in raising a child. So much love is invested. A parent's reward is seeing their children grow into good and moral human beings. In a career that suits their abilities and in their interests and surrounded by quality people. Along life's journey, they learn to be resilient enough to face life's challenges, to find love and someone like-minded to share their lives with. Stephanie had found Aaron. We have watched our children from these first days trying to understand how someone could do this to their precious, gentle sister. We watched them suffer and withdraw, hoping to cope with all of the repercussions of this tragedy. They have handled themselves with dignity and grace and have all been courageous in the face of such grief and in the public eye. Stephanie is with us during every moment of every day. She is in every activity, in every drawer, and cupboard. Her beautiful smile beams out at us from every photo, but we don't need photos. She is in our every cell, a heartbeat away. Her life is slowly, inevitably being packed into boxes. We are leaving her behind. There is no end for us. We had a truly amazing girl who was a constant source of pride and joy. Now we have to learn to live with the void that losing her has left. Such a tragic waste and a precious life unfulfilled. Eventually, the judge sentenced Vincent to life in prison for the murder of Stephanie, and he was also sentenced to another 15 years for sexually attacking her. His lack of remorse and lack of emotions in general indicated that there wasn't a chance that he could be reformed and would continue to be a threat to the community, so this was the only option. Marcus was also arrested and sent to prison for his involvement in the crime but he was only sentenced to 15 months, which really angered Stephanie's family and many members of the community. Many felt that Marcus should be given 25 years in prison for his crime, which was the maximum sentence for his offense. A Leeton resident named Mark started a petition to appeal Marcus's sentence too. He and many others felt like the sentence was way too lenient, and the petition received over 70,000 signatures, but nothing came from it. Marcus was released after only serving 15 months in prison. He apologized to Stephanie's family, but the apology did not change how the family felt about him. Now, Vincent had tried to appeal his sentence, but was not successful. He failed to file the appropriate paperwork in time, so it didn't work. So he's going to continue sitting in prison for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, Stephanie's family only continued to face bad news and horrible circumstances. Only three weeks after Vincent's sentencing, Stephanie's dad was hit by a falling tree and he died. Now, the family found some comfort in knowing that at least Stephanie was with her dad wherever they were, but this was still heartbreaking. The family tried to move on with their lives as best as they could. Aaron eventually found love again with a woman named Samantha, and the two of them went on to get married, which I can't imagine was easy to start, but at least Aaron did find some happiness and some fulfillment in his life. In 2018, Stephanie's family sued the New South Wales Department of Education because they claimed that they made huge mistakes when they were hiring Vincent. He wasn't supposed to have the school keys, yet he did. And he wasn't supposed to have the school's alarm code, yet he did. They also felt that if they had looked into his background a little bit deeper, they would have discovered that he had a pretty troubling past. But the school board said that they had done thorough background checks on Vincent and that they found nothing concerning nor did they notice any troubling behavior while he was working at the high school. But ultimately, they ended up settling out of court in June of 2020, so there was some sort of arrangement made. Stephanie's family and the town of Leon will forever be changed, no doubt. The family has continued trying to move on and live their lives in a way that they know Stephanie would want them to be, but it's incredibly difficult. They know, though, that Stephanie will never be forgotten and that she will be deeply missed by both friends and family. It is just such a heartbreaking case and one that was so senseless in every aspect of the word. This guy, Vincent, was showing these deep-rooted, disturbed behaviors and thoughts at such a young age that it seemed like it was just a matter of time before he inflicted this on somebody. Not the 12-year-old girl, but then on Stephanie. And if it hadn't been Stephanie, there is no doubt in my mind that it would have been somebody else. But I agree with the lawsuit. There should be more responsibility with the Board of Education because why did he have access to the school? Why did he have the alarm code? It's just, again, it's something that in my mind could have been prevented and it's just heartbreaking. She had all of these plans. She was going to get married. She was going to live her happy ever after with her soulmate and it was literally just snuffed away from her because of these selfish, grotesque, perverted behaviors and 
fantasies that this guy Vincent had. It's sick. It is sick. Thank you guys for staying with me and tuning in today to hear Stephanie's case and her story. I appreciate you sticking by and thanks for checking out the channel as well. Remember, I am dropping new cases many times throughout the week. So if you want to make sure you don't miss those, take a quick second. It's free to subscribe, but just hit that subscribe button so that next time you log into YouTube, you will see the new cases that I post. All right. Thanks again, guys. And until the next one, stay safe.